Uh, we're working our way through the book of the Revelation, so let's open to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15 and 16 is what we're going to study today, two chapters. Revelation 15 is short. In Revelation 14, we, we saw John have a vision of, of what, is the, what are the final judgments of God upon an unbelieving world. In Revelation chapter 15 and 16, it's a retelling of those same events with added information. And so it's a restatement. It's something that we find a lot in the Bible. A story is told or a truth is given, and then it's you know, restated again and more information is given. So chronologically, we are still in the same time period, but we, on this go around, if you will, as we look at it from these two chapters, more information is given to us. So before we begin, let me ask uh, God's blessing upon us. And if you would agree with me, that would be tremendous. Lord, we, we, we pray for our hearts as we're here today, God, that we would be giving people. There's nothing beautiful about selfish people, Lord. And Jesus, you are the prime example of, of one who came to give. So move in our hearts regarding these things. Also move in our minds and hearts regarding your word. Show us, Lord, your, your nature and your character. And may we love you for who you are, Lord, for all that you are, because everything that you are is beautiful and perfect, Lord. So convince us and teach us of that. We ask in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. These last series of judgments, they, there's been three groups of judgments, and they've come in, in groups of seven. There were the, the seal judgments and and second judgments, don't remember. And now we come to the bowl judgments. And, and John has had a vision of this. And as I said before, he's restating what he already saw and what was revealed to him in, in Revelation chapter 14. This, this is wrapping up God's dealing with planet Earth in regards to his judging of, of the wickedness of man, evil humanity, and especially because they reject Jesus Christ. And we're going to see here in these chapters, it's incredible to me what we're going to see in these chapters, the hardness of the hearts of man, even in the face of the omnipotence, the unmatched power of God, people can still, with their dying breath, blaspheme God. It's just amazing to me. So we're going to work our way through these two chapters here. The first, Roman numeral number one, uh, deals with chapter 15. Chapter 16 is where these bold judgments begin. But in chapter 15, we see the prelude to these bold judgments. So let's just work through here. Let me read some verses and we'll get started. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. In fact, I'm just going to read through the chapter here, eight verses. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested." After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke of the glory of God, and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. First thing I want to uh, focus on and take this a little bit out of numerical order regarding the verses, but I want us to consider what I'm calling the victorious worshipers. We see people here in the opening verse, verses here of, of chapter 15 who have come through the tribulation period under the reign and under the control of Antichrist. And I believe that these are people that have given their lives for their faith in Jesus. We were told in an earlier chapter 
that when Antichrist comes to power, he so desperately wants to be worshipped as God that he's going to set up the economy in such a way that you can't buy or sell unless you take a mark on, the, on your right hand or on your forehead pledging allegiance to him. So at that point in time, government and religion will all be tied together and it will all be for the glory of the one called the Antichrist. Obviously, there are people that are going to refuse that because during this time period, the gospel is still going to be preached and people are going to be saved. And so they, they give their lives as martyrs. And I believe that here in Revelation 15, that's who John is seeing. He's seeing these worshipers of God. Look at, verse, look at your notes, if you would. Um, their victory here is not that they were protected physically. Uh, turn back, if you would, over to Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. This is speaking of the one called Antichrist. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So in the future, God, during this last seven-year period of Earth's history, gives Antichrist limited free reign, kind of a paradoxical way to say it, but limited free reign. And he attacks the believers of Jesus Christ, and it says he overcomes them. And authority was given him over every tribe and tongue and nation. And so... He does have victory over them physically, but he does not have victory over them spiritually because where do we find them? We find them before the throne of God in heaven. They gave their lives, but their souls were saved because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Look at your notes, if you would. Revelation 7, 14. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So they don't stand condemned before God. They stand as worshipers before God. Now, I want you to consider this. God can physically protect his people from any harm. And we would say amen to that, right? God can protect us from anything. anything. He can protect his children from anything, but he often doesn't. He allows Christians to be killed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us perspective on this. He said in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Man can kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so guys, the greatest victory that we can have is not physical, but it's spiritual. I don't think I'm normally morbid. I'm probably morbid once in a while. Surely much less than all the rest of you. But I think about my death at times, you know. And it's going to be a bittersweet moment from, you know, if you read about the great saints, I'm not calling myself a great saint, but I'm, I'm a saint. I'm a St. William of, of Napa. And you're all saints if you're in Christ. And, and the thing about death is that, you know, like if I'm sick, I can go to the doctor and take medicine and, and hopefully get better. Or if I'm tired, I can sleep and, and feel better. Or if I'm stiff, I go to the chiropractor and I can feel better. But when that time comes to pass, as Roby Duke would say, to pass through the door where time is no more, I can't do anything about it. Death has its victory limited. Death has its sting. But the great victory for me and for you if you're in Christ is spiritual. Because everything about you except that temple that you're sitting in <laughs> the physical doesn't go on but everything else about you does and is actually eventually retrofitted for heaven the greatest victory that we will have guys is spiritual not not physical now i say that as as a perspective giver because what do we so often focus on the physical of course we have to pay attention to the physical i, I want to stay as healthy as i can so that i can serve the lord the best i can with the body that he's given me and what's left of it I'm losing pieces as time goes on. <laughs> They're being replaced by plastic and steel or just taken out altogether. It's okay. I'm still, I'm still vertical. I can walk and pretty much have my senses. <laughs> so we have to pay attention to the physical, but the physical is going to go. But I'm just saying this to reinforce the idea we so often overvalue the physical and undervalue the spiritual. And these worshipers here, gave up their lives because of their faith in Christ. They wouldn't take the mark, killed or, or persecuted or starved to death or whatever happened, but they were victorious. And they were worshiping before God. The song that they sang has two titles, the Song of Moses the Lamb, and also the Song of the Lamb. 
if, if you go back and read that song in verses uh, 3, 4, and 4, seven times the words you or yours are, are used. Uh, I don't want to go into a big rant and, and a thing about, you know, worship music, and it's a whole big topic, and people write about it and have all kinds of opinions about it, but I sure love the songs that are God-focused. It's not that I don't love other songs. You know, we worship, we sing in church hymns and, and psalms and spiritual songs. We sing all kinds of songs. And so there's a lot of legitimacy for a lot of style. I just pray that in our hearts we would never lose the songs. In fact, we used to sing this song about 25 years ago. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. You, 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 you. And when these saints get before God, you know, we, we sometimes sing about I'm, I'm fearful and, you know, that's legitimate or I'm, I'm struggling or I'm persecuted or I feel dry. Or, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to put those things down. But I do want to emphasize the other side of the coin. These guys aren't singing about how hard they had it. <laughs> They're singing about how glorious God is. And I just think that's a great perspective for us. Would you guys agree with that? It's a great perspective. I mean, they could write a real, they could write a good blues song, couldn't they? You know, we, we live under certain governmental situations. They lived under the Antichrist. <laughs> That's a blues song, right? <laughs> but they're singing about God. They're not singing about their blues because they've made it. They crossed the finish line. And I just think we, we would be immeasurably more benefited if we keep our attitudes and our worship very heavenly, not to discount the other stuff at all. God understands we're dust, we're frail, we struggle, all of those things. But just, just something to, to consider. The seven angels with the seven plagues. Look at verse 1. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues in them. The wrath of God is complete. I mentioned this la- last week. The word wrath there is themos, and it's a vo- volatile, passionate anger. Eleven times it's found in the New Testament, ten times in the book of the Revelation. This is when God finally says, I'm going to display my anger. Let me ask you this. Is God angry with sin in the world today? Yes. Has he fully displayed that anger? Mm -mm. In the book of the Revelation, he does. It all comes out now. How angry he is is finally known by humanity. The word also here is said it's complete, which means it's not just finished, but it's reached its goal. It's like when God finally says, now the world is going to see how angry I am and now my justice is coming forth and it's complete. It's not just that it's over and ended, but there's a purpose in him displaying his anger and it's because of the judgment of wickedness. And so the outpouring of his passionate anger has as its goal the finality of the judgment of sin. Look at verses 5 and 6. After these things, behold, the temple of the tabernacle and these angels, the seven angels come out of, out of the tabernacle, out of the temple, having the seven plagues. What I see in this is this. These guys, these guys, forgive me up there. <laughs> these angels, <laughs> they come out of God's presence with his judgment and they don't do it on their own. Everything that happens here, God is the authority. Now I want to ask you this. Do these angels have a pretty good view about the holiness of God? Absolutely. They have an untarnished view of God's holiness. They have an untarnished view of his righteous anger against sin. And yet they do not act upon it on their own. They wait until they are sent. Jesus said in John 8, 29, I always do those things that please him. Jesus surely hated the wickedness around him. In fact, we know at times it, it says that he was angry. One point he sat down and, and, and macramed a whip together. Macrame because I'm from the 70s, right? He macramed a whip together and drove the money changers out of the temple area. He was angry. But Jesus said, I only do those things that please the Father. So in his anger, he was restrained until he was released to show the holy displeasure of God. For us, there's an application. Look at your notes, James 1. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. As a Christian, you must have a holy hatred of sin. And I said it 
last week or the week before, we can become desensitized to sin because of our own spiritual battle within us. You know, the Spirit of God within me loves holiness and, and the flesh of Bill Walden doesn't. And so there's an internal battle with every single Christian that as I sow to the Spirit, I, of the Spirit, I reap everlasting life and I reap the things of God and I reap the mentality of God and I reap the passion of God and I begin to hate the things that used to be okay. Anybody, I'm going to turn this fan down. Is, hear that fan? See, it just sounds like a fan. How many of you used to be okay with certain things, but now later on in your Christian walk, you're kind of saying, how could I have ever thought that that was okay? Yeah, right on. We're growing in holiness. That's a mark of the work of the Spirit of God. And so we should have a hatred of sin. Increasingly, we should. Not, be, not what the church tells us, but what the Word of God tells us and the Spirit of God teaches us. But even in that hatred of sin, it's not yours to vent your anger or vent the anger of God. He may use you at the appropriate time to say, hey, this isn't right and this needs to change or we need to act on something or whatever. But just because you feel it doesn't mean you can act on it. God feels it and he doesn't act on it until the future in the fullness. Jesus felt it and he withheld himself. The angels felt it and they withheld themselves. We need to feel it, but we still need to withhold ourselves until God releases us to deal with certain situations. There's a, there's a principle there for us. Verse 7, the plagues were given to them to be poured out. Once again, God is in charge. By the way, these are shallow bowls. Uh, the Greek tells us, not like deep, like a big deep soup bowl, but more like a real shallow uh, platter. Uh, what's going to be poured out is poured out very easily. Verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Everything comes to a stop in heaven at this point until God's justice is poured out. In the Old Testament, we read about the presence of God manifested by smoke. Let me read that to you. When Moses, Moses was given instructions about how to build the first tabernacle where the worship of God would take place in the desert wanderings, when he completed that, the glory of God came down upon the tabernacle and they were just kind of knocked out. They just couldn't do anything. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So here, as God finally says to his angelic host, everything's on pause, nothing else is happening until this last series of seven judgments is poured out. And so there's just a pause in heaven. Chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. A foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And then I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So in the middle of these seven last judgments being poured out, what do we find? Starts with a wu, ends with an urship. We find worship. We find worship in the middle of judgment. I want to kind of develop this idea a little bit. These angels praise the righteousness of God. God, in his mercy, as we've been studying through the Revelation, has been up to the, not only the last, you know, not only the 11th hour, but the 59th minute. God has been ex extending mercy and offering mercy and offering pardon to humanity. We, as God's people, ought to have a somber but appreci an appropriate appreciation of God's judgment. 
I want you to just, let's just camp on this. What I want us to do today is say, is, is, is to do this and then come to our own conclusions as we wrestle through these things. We're all in a different place probably in our Christian life and we're, we're, all, we're all hopefully moving forward and, you know, wrestling with new thoughts and, and that's good, you know. The Bible says, Paul says in Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So we, we work through things. We work through our concepts of God you know, sometimes our emotions bump into our concepts of God, or sometimes culture bumps into the truths of God, and we have to decide, am I going to go with my emotions? Am I going to go with what the Bible's teaching me? That kind of thing. So I'm presenting these things so that we will just all continue to, to, to move forward and wrestle through what we believe in our theology about the person of Jesus Christ. The judgments of God are being poured out, and the angels in the middle of it are stopping to pray. Praise, excuse me. They're stopping to worship God as he's doing it. I remember, sometimes I remember, I take fish oil for that and flaxseed oil. <laughs> um, I remember as a kid being back, my, my dad grew up in Tennessee, uh, Rutherford County, a little place called, boy, I can't remember the name of it now. Huh? Mur near Murfreesboro, yeah, but there's Rockvale, Rockvale, Tennessee, and he was he was a hillbilly, <laughs> you know, barefoot to school and that whole thing, you know. Just anyway, I remember going back there as a kid, my, my mom and my sister and, and me and my dad, and we went to a cousin's house or something like that, and as we pulled up, a, a man was disciplining one of his coon dogs, and it was pretty rough. And I was, I remember telling my dad, dad, make him stop. And he says, no, nope, the dog needs it. Without the kind of discipline, it was, and, and to me as a little kid, I remember I was traumatized to see, you know, and he may have been going overboard, whatever. The, the point of the matter is that discipline of that dog was needed. It was, it was in, probably punishment. I think it was maybe mangling its own puppies or something like that. I don't know, it was some awful thing. But for me watching it, my emotions would say, dad, make it stop. He says, no, this is appropriate. That's a, a real low human parallel to what's happening here. God is judging planet Earth and the angels are praising him. And it just makes me think, in our own lives, do we, to that degree, appreciate and recognize the holiness of God? Guys, God is not just a little bit better than us on our best day. <laughs> you can giggle at that if you want. I kind of meant it that way. But just humor me, would you? Thank you. He's infinitely more holy than you. You on your best day are not even in the, in the same universe as, as God who never has a worst day in regards to holiness. He's perfectly holy. The fact that he endures humanity for all of the centuries that he has is amazing to me. The fact that Christ wants to dwell in me and does dwell in me is more amazing to me. I, I would love to escape myself at times. But Jesus has taken up residence by his spirit and in you too. I'd love to escape you sometimes. You'd love to escape me sometimes. But Jesus is pleased to dwell in us. Are you kidding me? He, he, God is so loving and so, you know, just, I, I'm, I'm falling short on adjectives here. It's just ama an amazing thing to me. Do we, I mean, we, we worship God often, as we should, you know, something good happens when we say, oh, God is good, you know? Yeah, he is. He's also good when nothing good happens. When you see nothing good happening, when you're sick as a dog, throwing your guts up and have a migraine and you lost your job, God is still good. Amen? He's still good. When people are mistreating you and maligning you and lying about you and accusing you, he's still good. And when he's disciplining you, when you have those moments, you know, of knuckleheadedness, and when he's disciplining me, and when he's punishing people, he's still good. And we should, we should worship him just as much then as when we get the promotion at work. Otherwise, it's just emotional worship. It's not, you know, it's not based on who he is. It's based on how we feel. And how wrong is that? How, how about if, you know, for those who are married, how about if you treated your spouse that way? You, you treated them well when you, when you were happy. <laughs> you know, no, we treat them well all the time. 
probably, probably a low example, but you guys catch what I'm saying. These an- God is pouring out his judgment on planet earth and the angels are saying, look at what they say. Verse five, you are righteous, O Lord. He's, he's going to destroy oceans. He's going to destroy lakes. Berryessa is going to be a pit. Maybe kind of already is. That's pretty nice. <laughs> Napa River <laughs> doesn't have to do much. <laughs> He's going to be destroying humanity. And the angels are saying, look what they say. You are righteous, O Lord. You're righteous for doing this. You're right for doing this. I think I got the... Uh, where it is it? I don't have it. Do I have it? I'm talking to myself. Just ignore me for a minute. He's doing the right thing. God cannot but do the right thing. And I just, wa- I just want to, you know, plant this thought in you guys. May we not be fair-weather worshipers of God. You know, may you worship the Lord in the hard times. Kevin Green, our friend up in uh, Fort Bragg, when no fruit is on the vine, I will trust in you, I will trust in you. This life is no longer mine, I will trust in you, I will trust in you. When God is judging people, Lord, you're righteous, you're holy, I praise you because I can't even see why you would judge this person or that person. But Lord, you see, I'm not going to judge you with my limited vision. I'm judging you, I mean, I'm worshiping you according to your revealed character and your word. And so there's a real lesson for us to learn there. Look at verses 5 and 6. You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, who is to be because you have judged these things. God, you're righteous because you're judging And I'll tell you what, a lot of people don't like that. They love that Jesus is love, but they don't like that Jesus is judge. You can't have him your way. We have to have him his way. Amen? We receive God according to his word, not according to our dictates. Otherwise, we end up with, a, you know, it says in the book of Genesis, God created man in his own image. If we don't receive God for who he is, then we we create him in our image. We return the favor. There was a group of people 20 years ago called the Jesus Seminar. They decided to take the Gospel of Mark and take the words of Jesus and vote on them if Jesus actually said uh, things or not. And the only thing that they all agreed on was that uh, Jesus actually said, a render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. And they threw out everything else in the Gospel of Mark. They created Jesus in their image. They weren't allowing him to create them in his image. So these angels, look at verse 6. It's harsh, but it's holy. And holiness is good. They have shed the blood of saints and prophets. You have given them blood to drink. It is their just due. It's bittersweet when judgment comes. It's bittersweet when a criminal gets caught. It's bittersweet when, you know, when a politician is impeached. All of these things, it's bittersweet when a friend gets arrested. Because we we have emotions, but we know it's the right thing. And so nothing could be more right than the justice of God. His, his justice and his judgment is just as right as his love. They are not, one is not higher than the other. They are the same. We need, to God, we need to worship God for all of those things as well. These plagues, we can go through them really quickly. Verse 1, the command is given. In fact, I'm just going to read through the notes. Follow along if you would. The command is given. Nothing happens without God's direction. Verse 2, the first bowl judgment soars upon the flesh of mankind. They refuse Jesus and choose the Antichrist. They took the Antichrist mark. Now they're marked with the judgment of God. Verse 3, the complete annihilation of all life in the oceans. Now you you would think that people, I'm persuaded that at this point, people can still repent, but they won't. Verse 4, contamination of all freshwater sources. Verses 8 and 9, Men scorched by the sun, and there's no repentance, and there's no worship. Look at verse 9. And men were scorched by, uh, with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. They knew it was God. They will know that it's God, and they still don't repent. Hardness of the heart of man. Look at what David Gusick says. The failure of men to respond with repentance shows that knowledge or experience of judgment will not change man's sinful condition. Those who are not won by grace will never be won. We have to have a sense of our own wrongness and God's offer of pardon. Undeserved favor is what we need. And and undeserved favor is what we need to recognize. Verses 10 and 11, 
The fifth bowl of judgment is darkness that can be felt and darkness that has pain. Jesus described hell as outer darkness. One commentator said this is just a preview. In Exodus chapter 10, we saw that before. The Lord said to Moses, stretch your hand toward heaven so that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. So these people, once again, acknowledge that it's from God, but they don't turn to God. The sixth judgment, verses 12 to 14, Speaks about, eight, uh, speaks about armies that are satanically inspired to march from what is called the east. The Euph- Euphrates River in ancient times uh, thought to be a barrier from invading armies. Uh, Euphrates River is going to be dried up and armies will march from the east. This is going to be a military attack that is satanically inspired. We haven't read those verses yet. Let me read them. Verse 10, the, Fifth angel, we poured, yeah, let me start at verse 12, if you would. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, Antichrist, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. This war that's going to take place, I, I believe this is speaking of what is called no, this, what is known as the Battle of Armageddon, and the people that will gather against Christ and his people are inspired by demons and by demon-possessed people who are doing signs and wonders. They're saying, wow, look at, look at that guy. Let's follow him. He's doing miracles. Let's follow him. They're following him right into their death way I understand it. Verse 15, in the middle of all of this, another word of encouragement to God's people. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. In the middle of all this, there are still people that have not turned to to Antichrist. There there are still people, even in in the last moment, that are saved, that have somehow survived the tribulation period. And God is encouraging them. Hang on. Verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Website called philologos.org. Let me read it to you. Armageddon is Greek for the Mount of Megiddo. This, This is a geographical location in Israel today. This valley has seen more climactic battles than any other place on earth. Originally, Megiddo was one of the capitals of the Canaanites, the Egyptian king Thothmes III, Call him Thoth for short. The founder of an empire once said Megiddo is worth a thousand cities because of its military strategic location. The reason is that it sits on the pass leading through Mount Carmel to the Mediterranean, one of the most strategic crossroads in Palestine. Anyone who wishes to control the Middle East must control the vital trade and military routes which connect Europe, Africa, and Asia. Napoleon stood at Megiddo before the battle that thwarted his attempt to conquer the East and rebuild the Roman Empire. Contemplating the enormous plain of Armageddon, the marshal declared, all of the armies of the world can maneuver their forces on this vast plain. And this is going to be the pl- and we're going to read more about it as we go through the book of the Revelation. These armies are being satanically led and inspired to meet against Jesus Christ and his people at this place. And God is allowing them to be gathered together because he's going to bring judgment upon them. Let me read these final verses. If you have any questions, please text them in. Verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. Every hailstone, the weight of of a talent, about 100 pounds. Notice this again. Unbelievable. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. They know it's from him. That just absolutely blows me away. They know it's from him, and they won't turn to him. 
some takeaway thoughts for you here at the bottom of the page. Some things just to think about, wrestle through, pray about, consider. Number one, do you emotionally praise God for his blessings but not for his holiness and justice? May we not be fair weather worshipers, right? May, may you worship. I, I, think, I think the value of worship perhaps is even more precious to God when you're having a super bad time than it is when you come in kind of bouncy because everything is going well this week. Because, you know, when you're, when you're sitting here or just walking through life and life is extremely difficult and you still say, Lord, I worship you and I praise you, that's a true declaration of, of praise to God. It's not based on, on situations. And so I, may the Lord help us to grow into that. Amen? Number two, God is unbelievably suffering, long-suffering with wicked mankind, his patience, but his patience will one day end. He's going to wrap it all up. Everything that we see in the world, it's all going to be judged appropriately. And people will receive what is due to them. I like to say it this way, God's going to make it right. Number three, given the incredible hardness of heart in the midst of God's clear judgment... Isn't it amazing that if you are a Christian today, it's because God granted unto you repentance? Our hearts, guys, apart from Christ, are no different from these people blaspheming God in the book of the Revelation. Apart from Jesus, that could be us. And in the midst of the worst suffering of human history, they still don't turn to God. How is it that we turn to God? He granted repentance to us. He favored us with his divine grace. Not getting into the Calvinism versus Arminian argument. I'm just saying what is the obvious. How is it that we should be saved? You know, sometimes we may think that, oh, it's going to have to get worse for him before it gets better. Sometimes it doesn't get better. It just gets worse. And we see it here, don't we? But I just reflect on my own life. Why'd you save me? I don't deserve it. These people don't deserve it. Why would you save us? We have the, the same capacity to be like these people, and yet you were good to us and merciful to us. Look at this final verse, if, and then I'll try to answer some questions if there are any. Second Timothy, servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance... God grants people repentance so that they may know the truth. As God has granted repentance to us and poured, you know, spoke to us by his spirit, and, and yes, it's our decision to believe, but it was his decision, if you will, t- to grant us the ability to believe. How those two things meet, I don't understand, but there it is. If God will perhaps grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captivity by him, taken cap- captive by him to do his will. I'm just, I'm just astounded, honestly, by God's goodness to me and all of us. Are you guys? <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Any questions today? Seeming contradiction regarding the judgment. Give me a minute. I have to look this all up. If anyone hears, I'm reading from John 12, 47. If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to, the, to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me does not receive my words, has, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him, the word that I spoke and will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. The only way that I could explain verse 47, if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. Judgment has been given over to the Son, but it may be that Jesus here is saying, it's not, I didn't come on my own initiative to judge people. The Father has sent me to judge them. So that would be my first 
a response to that, but I will research that a little bit and put it on the Cornerstone Facebook page and try to give a more complete answer because this looks like it's going to be, well, it's gone now, but can you put it back up there? Let me read 939. This is one of those uh, not a quick answer kind of questions. Yeah, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, that those who may see, that those who think they see may be made blind. And finally, 849. Uh, not why this is not sure why this is included in the question, but I'll read it and maybe it'll make sense to me later. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Kind of the trajectory that I get all of this over all of this, and this is my quick answer, and I will research it this week and put it on our Facebook page. I believe the judgment has been given over to the son. Jesus, remember, he said that there will be people that he will say to, depart, you depart from me, I never knew you. But I don't think he's self-authorized in, in being the judge. I think the authorization comes from his father. So I think the language points things in that direction. But I will, good question, fair question. I will research it and put it on the Cornerstone uh, Facebook page this week. So, by the way, we are now live streaming on Facebook. So uh, you, if anybody, yeah, we got a great media team, Mario and the group back there. So if you're ever home, just go to our Facebook page and you can watch it live. You can direct friends and family and that kind of thing to the Facebook page too. So um, let's stand, shall we? You know, could, could we open our Bibles and for a closing spoken song, Revelation 15. Could you open your Bibles to that? And I just want us to read this together. Revelation 15, 3, where the song starts. Could you read along with me, please? Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Let's pray together. Lord, you alone are holy, Lord. You alone are good. You alone are perfect. You are omnipotent, omnipresent, Lord, and perfect in all of your ways. May our hearts, may our minds be just caught up with you in worship, in recognition, in increased understanding, and more and more devotion and obedience, Lord. Would you use us, God? Heal the, heal the things in us, Lord, that need to be healed. Meet us where we're at. You're the friend of sinners, Lord. You bow down to us to lift us up, God. Uh, may we say yes to you in everything, Lord. Bless this group. Lord, bless Cornerstone, and bless your church in Napa. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.